All right, uh, so good morning, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks again for joining uh, the Sundays with Doug, where, uh, where the hundredfold journey is about uh, coming alongside of you guys and uh, providing you with the tools uh, for your spiritual journey, because we're all embarking on a journey. And the hundredfold is about you know, rewiring your brain, building new habits and creating a new identity. Because a hundredfold, again, is about uh, a group of people who are looking to find their true identity and by doing so, finding God's true identity. One of the first things that we always talk about are the 10 truths. And uh, these truths are true for you, just like they were true for Jesus. And sometimes it doesn't feel like you're always in the right place at the right time or that all your needs are constantly met. But because of who you are, and that is that you are a child of God. Uh, God is in you. He is, we are his dwelling place, that all of these truths are true for us. So I just ask that every week that you continue to work on memorizing, applying these and meditating these um, for your life. And we're in this series called I Am the Dwelling Place of God. And each of our series, we have uh, Bible verses that we try to focus on and uh, actually memorize. And we have two verses for this series. The first one is 1 Corinthians 3.16, where it says, you are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you. And then the second one is John 17.22, I have given them the glory, the glory you gave me that we may be one as we are one. And John 17 is actually Jesus uh, praying to God, our father, and basically, he's saying, hey, the same life that I lived here on earth, the same glory that you gave me, um, I'm giving to them, which is us, that we may be one as we are one. So there's no separation. We are the dwelling place. He is in us, which is amazing. So what we're doing is we're walking through the temple. Uh, back in the Old Testament, there was a place called the Tabernacle, which was the meeting place of God. And, and in fact, going back up to this picture, this is what it looked like, uh, the Tabernacle in the Old Testament. And in that temple, in that Tabernacle, there were seven pieces of furniture. And if you'll remember, the last series that we did were the seven I am statements of Jesus. And amazingly, those seven I am statements uh, I am the bread of life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the, uh, those seven I am statements can actually be found in the temple. So we'll be talking through those seven I am statements as we go through uh, this tabernacle. And here's the pieces of furniture, the bronze altar, bronze laver, table of showbread, lampstand, incense, covenant, and mercy seat. So that's, uh, that's the path we're on. So this week, uh, we're doing the bronze laver. Last week, if you haven't heard uh, the introduction, then I'd recommend going back to part one, which was last week. And we basically did a walk through the temple to um, um, as an introduction so that uh, you knew as we got to the, uh, the bronze laver uh, where we were at. Um, so the homework assignment uh, this week was uh, to talk about, and you know what? I'm just realizing we didn't cover, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna backtrack here. We didn't cover the full thing of part one because we ran out of time. So we're not covering the bronze laver this morning. Uh, we are call, uh, doing the, the, the brazen altar, uh, the bronze altar. Uh, so again, last week we covered all of this, which was talking about uh, the tabernacle and uh, so again, if you haven't seen this, then please go back um, to that series and it's online on YouTube. You can also go on, the, on our Facebook. <laughs> so this is everything that we covered last week. Um, so this week, uh, we're gonna be covering the, the bronze altar. Um, this is the second part of the introduction. And the homework assignment was to read Exodus 27 and then answer uh, a, a flurry of questions regarding this piece of furniture. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and read it for us. And again, Exodus chapter seven says, and you shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits, which by the way is 18 inches. And 18 inches was from the bottom of your elbow 
to the tip of your middle finger. So if you kind of hold it down on the table, um, that equals 18 inches because they didn't have yardsticks or measuring tapes back then. So it was all about, you know, the, the, the average distance of the elbow to the middle finger. Um, so it's five cubits long and five cubits wide. So basically it's a perfect square. The altar shall be square <clears throat> and its height shall be three cubits and shall be its horns on its four corners. Its horn shall be one uh, of one piece with it and you shall overlay it with bronze and you shall make its pails for removing the ashes and its shovels and its basins and its forks and its fire pans. You shall make all of its utensils bronze. You shall make for it a grating of network of bronze, so basically like a mesh, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings for its four corners. You shall put beneath under the ledge of the altar so that the net will reach halfway up the altar. You shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. Its poles shall be inserted into the rings so that the poles shall be on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. You shall make it hollow with planks and it is, and it was shown to you in the mountain, so shall you make it. So basically these are instructions from God to Moses. And what Moses saw when he went up on the mountain was uh, a representation of this whole tabernacle. Uh, so basically what, what, what God is instructing them is, is as heaven is, so it will be on earth. So he's instructing Moses to make this tabernacle as he saw it on the mountain to be here on earth. And last week we talked about, you know, uh, the Israelites talked that the tabernacle was heaven on earth. Because that's where God's dwelling place is. So anyways, this was the, uh, the homework assignment. Uh, and there'll be some questions that we'll be answering based on those, uh, uh, those verses. So here's kind of a, a picture of, of the bronze altar. You've got the horns and, and basically it's, it's a fire. It's an all consuming fire where people would bring, again, this is the Old Testament, uh, an animal sacrifice. Um, and in John 1 29, it says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus was the end of sacrifices as it was described in the Old Testament. So the very first piece of furniture, the reason I like this picture is because this guy is now entering into the, uh, into the courtyard and the very first piece of furniture that he encounters is the bronze altar of sacrifice. And here's a description of uh, a little bit better description of what it looks like, right? It's a three by five. You've got the horns on the corner, and then you've got this grate where uh, the coals would be underneath, and then you would lay the meat on top of that, and then it would be consumed. And what's interesting is that the uh, notice the poles. So the poles were on every single piece of furniture, and that's because this was a movable tabernacle. It was a tent on the go, if you will. So uh, back in the Old Testament, the children of Israel, after they were released from Egypt, uh, they, were, they went into the wilderness and for 40 years, they traveled in the wilderness. And I think they moved like 30 times. I don't remember what the number was. They, they moved quite a bit. <clears throat> over those 40 years. So this tent, this, this whole tabernacle had to be built in such a way that it was movable and you had to pick it up and then move to the next spot. So this guy, the way they did it is they put it on these poles, they'd carry it on their shoulders and then they would move to the next, next stop. Now, what's interesting about that, right, is where are we today? And are we a movable tabernacle? Yeah, right? So where God, <clears throat> excuse me, where God leads us, we've talked before about the breadcrumb trail. 
where where God leads us, uh, whether it's fire by day or a cloud, sorry, cloud by day or a fire by night, you know, that breadcrumb trail, uh, as we see God move, we move. So we are the moving temple. We are the moving tabernacle of God. And all of these things are inside of us. That makes sense? Yep. All right, so the homework assignment. So uh, the very first question is, uh, as far as the location, um, why, why is the location important? And, and here it is in the picture, right? So the tabernacle, uh, the, the tent of meeting is there, uh, but the very first piece of furniture is this, uh, this bronze, uh, bronze altar. Um, why, why, is, why is that location important? Well, I mean, it didn't it signify that basically the only way you can be holy or get into that place is to have a sacrifice. That was what they believed in, right? So you had to like bring something in to contribute to you being holy, I guess. Right. So the Old sure. Testament is our shadow. It's our parable. It's, it's, uh, describing something physical with something spiritual so this right. is now inside of us so we don't have to do anything to be holy now that holiness is inside of us right doesn't, but doesn't the, the 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 altar or the bronze or that the first part isn't the door jesus to get in but isn't the sacrifice also jesus at the same time isn't all of that just jesus you got it that's correct. Because that's what right. we're And that theory. goes back to the seven I am statements, right? I am the door. I am the bread of life. Right? If you eat my blood and you if you drink my blood and eat my flesh, right? And that's found, and, and we covered that last week about the table of showbread, uh, the mercy seat. You know, the uh, I am the light of the world that represents the candlestick. So yes. All of these represent the seven I am statements. And yes, this, this is Jesus who is in us. And we are holy. We are blameless. And Jesus is now describing that to us with his life. So you're saying that technically Jesus was a moving um, holy place in a way? Absolutely. Because he, he, he didn't have to set up all this stuff. He just moved around when he wanted to move around. Correct. So 1 John 4, 17, what's that verse? And I know Lonnie knows that one. Lonnie? Well, he is. Oh, shoot. Yeah. I, so I am of this world. Yep. As he is, so I am. Yeah. So, so yes, Jesus was a walking, moving temple. There is no separation. He's given us that same glory, the same glory that Jesus has, we have. And yes, we're now a walking, movable temple, right? The only I am the temple of God. He dwells within me, and everywhere the, I go, I am God. The only difference is, is that when Jesus was a walking temple, nobody had to physically sacrifice anything um, to be loved. I feel like because um, in that temple, as you've shown, that's all physical, right? They, I that's mean. Right. That seems, that seems really like a religious thing to do is only allow people to come in if you have an animal to sacrifice. So what if the poor people had nothing to sacrifice and they weren't welcome in? Well, I was going to ask that too. Yeah, they actually had to present like a turtle dove, which you could get for like pennies. Um, so there were, there were options for poor people. Yes. The sliding scale. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, it's the it's, same way. It's the same way it is nowadays. I mean, even in our churches nowadays, you know, it's the same thing. You know, who can give can, and what can be the sacrifice to me now is more of percentage wise of what can be put in. Um, and a lot of poor people, you know, they have a lot, you know, that are in poverty have a hard time with that. So it's like still the same. But is that just that's just because the economy and our government's changed everything up. 
Yeah, and and just to put a spiritual spin on it, uh, so when Jesus went to one of the temples, uh, there was a a lady, uh, an elderly lady that actually put in like two cents into the bucket, which compared to everybody else. And what Jesus said is, hey, look at that woman. She gave everything that she had. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I remember that. And, and he, he acknowledged her uh, for her giving. Um, so again, it, it does, it, it, I guess the, the point is, is it doesn't matter about the size or the amount. It's what's in the heart. That's what God is looking at. Okay, yeah. So uh, with this tabernacle here, with the way that the temple is, is this the only temple there was? Or was there, did he have, was there other set up elsewhere throughout the, you know, countries, the world, whatever? Good question. Um, so our, our view, um, since we're Western, you know, Western religion, it's Christianity, right? So when, when I talk, when I teach, it's, it's based on what I learned because of where I am. Uh, now, Rashi coming from an Eastern culture, um, you know, there might be other temples out there that represent this, that look the same. Uh, so Rashi, I'm not sure if, you know, on the, the Eastern side, certainly they have temples, but whether it, it looks the same as this, I don't know. Well, well you know, it, I, I'm not well, saying it does it look the same as this. What I mean is, like, was this the only one and only where they, this could take place for the sacrifices? Or was there... Gotcha. Yes. You know what this I mean? Was the was only, this was okay. the only place. And so just to give you a little bit more backstory, this tabernacle followed them um, out of the Egypt when they went into the wilderness for 40 years and then they crossed into the Jordan, they went into the promised land and then it became a permanent residence in, I don't remember, it might've been Jerusalem. I'm not sure. That's what I was and thinking. then when King David came and we're talking hundreds of years later, he actually built a physical with, with brick and mortar and, yeah. and concrete oh. and rocks and stones Okay. So it went from a, a fleshly movable object to a permanent one. So but, is that the part where uh, Jesus said to tear it down in three days? That's I haven't correct. Built? Okay. Okay. Correct. Sorry, Mike. No, I was just saying I was, I was right. So this was actually before, this was before Jesus. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because I was like, during Jesus' time, they... They have their own. They had their own huge building. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so this was like during. This was like after Moses, a short time after Moses. No, it's during Moses. Oh, okay. Oh, right. So Moses gave instructions based on what he saw on Mount Sinai. He oh. visually saw God's temple in the heavens, the way he had it set up, and uh. they duplicated that down here on Earth. And that's why it's called heaven on earth. Uh, and then after the temple was made, God came and indwelled this tabernacle. And perfect illustration, right, of us. When we are born, right, we are the tabernacle and he comes and indwells us. Pretty amazing. I mean, all of this are types and shadows, parables in the Old Testament that speak about who God is and where God is. Yeah. He's been on us all along. We just didn't realize it. So technically, that, technically people that during that time didn't even need the tabernacle. It was on the head. Correct. So it was the physical representation of who they already were inside. So God basically was speaking to them and revealing it to him, just like he had to do with Jesus. Jesus is the physical representation of who we are. He, he knows it. He, he knew exactly who he was, and he was demonstrating that for us so that we could then look at Jesus and say, ah, that's what life is all about. So this so is the same in the Old Testament with this tabernacle. So you is know? this tabernacle preparing 
uh, for the crucifixion. It was a, a type of a type of resemblance of the crucifixion before Jesus was crucified because a- absolutely the sacrifice of animal is technically crucifixion. I mean, it's killing. It's killing something that's innocent, in a right. way. I guess. Okay. Yep. So, so Rashi, uh, just because I, I know you have the uh, the Eastern background, do you recall any temples or anything that kind of look like this or places of worship? Um. Not, well, I may not be the best person to ask, to be honest, but also um, from my experience, from what I've seen of the temples that are there, um, and or even historically, um, temples in the Eastern culture, well, at least in Southeast Asia, tend to be more of depictions of gods and their abilities and, uh, you know, God's representing different things in nature and essentially just kind of um, showing a union between man and uh, earth, essentially, and where we are. Um, but yeah, this this is what actually has transformed me and uh, my perception. I mean, just it's interesting how the last time when I first joined our study, we were in the tabernacle. And now after taking <laughs> some time off, I really am, it's a sign from God. And I I know I needed to hear something today and this is just wonderful. Um, So I do have a question, Doug. I'm curious to kind of understand why bronze was significant and why bronze was chosen as a material of choice. Is it because of, was that the only thing that was essentially available at that time? Or is there another reason that bronze maybe symbolizes something perhaps? Ah, excellent. Excellent question. And I think that's either the next page or the two more pages down. So we'll, we'll get into that. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Because yes, there is a significant, significant, there is a good reason why bronze was chosen. Yep. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, so again, this is all part of the homework assignment. Uh, so please for next week, um, you'll, you'll be able to find these same questions for the next piece of furniture. Uh, but so each of these questions, by the way, just, just to kind of help you out, every single one of these questions that I'm going to be asking, location in the temple, why is this important, uh, mm-hmm. will be for each piece of the furniture. So mm-hmm. as we go through this, each page that we go through will actually be questions for your homework assignment. So you can write down what you think the answer is, and then we can review it on next Sunday. So the location uh, in the temple Uh, It was located in the outer court. Jesus was crucified outside the camp, outside the temple, which I thought was interesting because if you look at the the temple, this is the meeting place of God right here. And and Jesus was crucified outside the camp. Um, So it's interesting that it wasn't in the actual temple where Jesus was crucified. It was outside. And it was placed on a mound so the ashes could be collected underneath. So this was actually kind of a, the box was raised and underneath there was some ashes that then they could collect and, you know, keep it clean and keep the fire going. Uh, What's interesting there is Jesus was crucified on a mound called Golgotha. So just a little, you know, correlation there. And then finally, it was the furniture, it was the first furniture as you walked in before you went any further into the temple which describes that we need to be aware that God has accepted us and that we are one with him. There is no separation because of what God did to demonstrate that love for us by allowing man in his full rage and fury to kill his only begotten son like a lamb slain. So the very first thing that we need to realize as we understand our true identity is that God loves us completely that there, we are completely forgiven um, any sin, any fallen mindset, any doubt about who we are is demonstrated on the cross, or in this case, the, the, uh, the bronze altar, and that that sacrifice was given to demonstrate his love for us. And it, again, that's so important to be that first 
thing that we see and that we know. And then from there, we can go into the other pieces of furniture and truly understand their meaning behind them. Okay, uh, so now the next question is, what material was used for its construction? Why? And what does this represent? So if you go back to, uh, if you go back to the Exodus reading, <clears throat> you'll be able to pull things out, right? That it was acacia wood and that, uh, um, you know, there was bronze that were used and their pails and, and, and so forth. Uh, so there's different, um, different meanings behind that. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and just speak to it. So anytime that there is wood found in the Bible, it's always a representation of man. So, and, and the reason for that is because where does wood come from? It comes from trees and trees are also a representation of man. And why do trees represent man? It's because we're coming out of the ground, right? When man, when God breathed his breath into man, we came out of the ground. So <laughs> wood always represents man, right? And, and wood is, um, uh, it's temporary, right? It can rot um, and, and, and it's temporary in nature. And especially if you cut it down, right? Then it just becomes a piece of wood that's basically it dead. It doesn't grow anymore. It withers away. Sorry? It withers away. It withers away, exactly. Unless you do something with it. And what they ended up doing here is they covered it with bronze. And bronze represents judgment and redemption. And the illustration that's used is while they were in the desert, um, there were snakes that were biting people and Moses lifted a rod um, with a bronze serpent on it. And maybe you guys have seen this. I, I probably should have added the picture. You know, the picture of medicine these days is a staff with a, uh, uh, a snake wrapped around it, right? Uh, and that represents redemption, but it's also, it's also bringing healing uh, to the people. So bronze, though, represented um, judgment. And then fire, with the fire that burns and it consumes, that's part of purification. And John 15 says, uh, fire burns the works done by man. So it's representing that, that, that uh, the symbol there is God is the one that provided the way. He's the one that provided the sacrifice. And there's nothing that we have to do to earn it or to receive it. We, or, sorry, to earn it, we just receive it. And then there's four horns, right, on each of the corners, and that represents power. Anytime you see the word horn uh, in the Bible, it represents power or strength. When you think of that, you think of a bull um, or an ox that has the horns, and those are very powerful creatures, and, you know, they can, they can slam into things. So that's what horns represents. So Jesus became man, which also could be considered flesh or wood, and revealed God's love for us because of the fire, and took on man's judgment upon himself, which is bronze, so that he could reveal his power, which is the horns, that no matter what man did or didn't do, his love was unconditional. Isn't that amazing? The very first piece of, I'm just getting tingles, uh, just amazing that <clears throat> the first piece of furniture is a perfect picture of, of who Jesus is, representing the wood, the fire, the bronze, and the horn. So basically, that, that, that bronzing area, that, that first word when you come in, that's written like a representation of the crucifixion, a cruci be him being crucified. But this is a later, this is an earlier representation of how they felt it was. But in the New Testament, they're showing uh, the crucifixion of him actually on the on the cross, right? Correct. 
It was so God, <clears throat> God demonstrating that he knew exactly what needed to take place, what was going to take place. In the future. And this was a picture, not only of what Christ was going to do, but also a representation of who we are. And it was all pictured with shadows and parables in the Old Testament, so that today we can look back and say, God had this down all along. This is not a mistake. This is not God just reacting to anything and like, you know, this is all his purpose, which again is just mind blowing that, you know, literally so, this is 4,000, 5,000 years ago. <clears throat> so what's amazing for me is I'm actually picturing that, go back to that picture real quick. <clears throat> I'm actually picturing like Jesus literally sitting there, you walking in and he, he's looking at you like, you don't need any, you don't, you don't need any, uh, any lamb. You don't need anything like that. You're, you're here. So technically even that house in the back, that doesn't, that doesn't even mean anything. Technically it's just the, when you walk in, he's just there, right? Well, well, again, it does mean things because <clears throat> it's reminding us of who we are right. and that this temple is us. If you go back to this picture here, oh, sorry, I forgot. This one, you can see that each of these, we are the temple. If you lay us down mm -hmm. on top of the temple, we see right at the beginning, uh, right at our, our, uh, our, um, our, the base of who we are is, um, is this. And then we walk so through. Is the mind, is the mind, is the mind, the door? That what's that part on the on the mind and the brain right there? That's I can't. That's the, oh, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. That's the Holy of Holies, and that's the the Mercy Seat and the uh, uh, the Tabernacle, or not the Tabernacle. The uh... okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, why can't I think of it? <clears throat> the Mercy Seat. Yeah. So you've got the uh, the Holy of Holies which is the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and the other pieces of furniture. So this is us. This is who we are. So how come the Holy of Holies, though, sometimes yeah. tells the tent, the soul, that it's not worthy? You see what I'm saying? Right. So, so it's because the mind is forgiving what has already occurred. So to some degree, <clears throat> if you have a thought like that, like I'm not worthy, I'm never going to be good enough, you know, God's out there and I'm here, it's that you're not understanding who you truly are and that each one of these pieces of furniture describe who you are. And if you start with the very first one that says, I'm accepted, I'm loved, uh, God demonstrated that love, um, then we'll remind ourselves, oh, that's right, it's not about me. It's about everything that he did for me. See, that sacrifice part's got me, it's got me thinking because that's like a prediction of going into the New Testament, you know, yeah. just, just in a different manner, you know, it was sacrificing whatever anybody can bring, you know, a goat, dove, whatever, but it goes to show how the prediction, to me, what was projected for later was uh, Jesus crucifying on the cross as a human, you know, as life, you know, rather than goats or any of all this. It's like it's kind of stopping, kind of stopping crucifying things and people, you know what I mean? It was like, to me, that was like a representation of that, a redemption of that, I would say. Yep. Yep. Very good. So then the next one is the size and shape. <clears throat> So why was it that particular size and shape? And what do these numbers represent? Um, so if you remember, we talked about uh, the five cubits, right? Which is, uh, you know, the, the elbow to the finger. Um, so it was basically 90 inches or seven and a half feet. Uh, five is the number of grace. So five is, is grace and it's forgiveness 
And if you look in, in the Bible, the number five always represents that. Um, for example, the feeding of the 5,000 uh, led with five loaves and two fish. So there you've got uh, you know, the number five twice. Uh, he was showing grace to these 5,000 people by feeding them. Uh, at the pool of Bethesda, there were five porches at the, at the pool and he healed the man with infirmity. Five is the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, which is the letter He, which when you look at the Hebrew letter He, it's actually an open window, which is basically an open invitation. It's grace, you can come in. Uh, 50 is the year of Jubilee, uh, which is when all the slaves of Israel were set free. And this box, which is, represents the sacrifice that Christ demonstrated, the love, was a five by five box measurements of the bronze altar. So it's just grace upon grace upon grace. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not for yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. So it's grace upon grace. We just, we just, it's in us. There's nothing we're doing. There's no sacrifice that we need to make. There's no animal that we need to bring. It's all been provided for us. So basically, we just sacrifice our habits that we picked up and seen with our eyes of this world. So if we're going to sacrifice anything now. It's sacrificing all the negativity, the 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 habits that we have of what we do, like smoking, drinking, whatever you know, bad mouthing, double tongue sword, you know, and all that. That's our sacrifices now to give up that and show the inner love of what we have from uh, the Holy Spirit that uh, Jesus has given to us. So, Lonnie, I, I, like, I like what you said. However, we just have to be careful that when we do or don't do those things, it doesn't change who we are. Mm. So if I'm drinking, uh, I'm smoking, I'm doing stupid stuff. God's love never changes. He's mm -hmm. always in me. He doesn't yeah. say, see you later. Goodbye. I'm done with you. You know, come on, clean up your act. No. So the motivation for us is what am I doing to the temple? Right. Am I, and, and Rashi, I'll try to remember your quote. Um, you said that since God is in us and living his life through us, I want to make sure that my temple is clean so that God has a great experience through me. Yes. I don't want to give God cancer. I don't want to give God, you know, time in jail. I don't want to, I want him to enjoy this life through me as me and make it as enjoyable as possible. And guess who benefits with that? I do. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So because what religion does tell us is, you know, all right, God loves you 98%. And if you just quit smoking, if you quit drinking, then he's going to be all in for you and he's going to love you completely. But until then, clean up your act. You need to, you need to fix this. But we're freed from that religious bondage because that's what it is. It's bondage. Well, you know, there's a lot of bondage with that. I had to tell my, you know, and I look at it like this too. I, uh, with my doctor, I even had to tell him, hey, I don't want the medication. So there were certain medications they wanted to give me. Yeah. But it's a choice, you know, and, and but that, that, that it's, it's not about the medication. It's a matter of that. Uh, you know how I used to talk about with my mom and stuff, you know, with all that, yeah. Yeah. uh, but it, it feels better when I'm, I'm stronger at telling that doctor, look, no, I don't want that medication. Yep. And hearing them trying to force it upon me, you know, like you really should because this will ease this and this will do that. And it's like, no, it, that doesn't work anymore. You know, but there's certain ones I do have <clears throat> to take, uh, but not as powerful, but they're different. So what what's amazing about that, Lonnie, and, and thank you for sharing that is, our body, the way God designed us, is we are the largest pharmaceutical factory-making machine on the planet. All the chemicals that we need for health and repair 
are already in us. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because our cells, our DNA, they actually have receptors that when a chemical comes in, <clears throat> if the body needs it, it, it creates it so that it can receive it and then heal. Yeah. So, um, so Lonnie, your position is, is a good one. Um, through the power of our mind and our thoughts, we have the ability to create those same exact chemicals that the doctors want to give us, but that's a synthetic one, right? That's been made by man and it exactly. has all sorts of other stuff around it. And I think Lonnie, that's what you're kind of concerned about. So now, now what you can do is create that through your own chemical system within your body. And the evidence out there to prove that is the, um, uh, the placebo. You know, you take a placebo, you give a group of 100 people the pill that says you will be, you'll be healed with this if you take this pill, uh, and it's one that was made by the doctors, and then you give 100 people a sugar pill, the results are very much the same in regards to the healing process because of the power of the mind. Oh, Man, you oh, mean yeah. if I take this sugar pill, you don't tell them it's a sugar pill, I'll be, I'll be better? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're, we're kind of getting, getting off task, but, uh, but the important part here is that, um, is that this was given to us by grace and this very first piece of furniture represents that. Uh, Doug, I'm sorry, may I say yeah. something real quick? Yeah. Uh, just kind of going back on that picture of the temple, again, where the bronze uh, altar is outside. Yes. Um, do you think that maybe because of its location, because it's outside of that tent, I almost get this kind of feeling and understanding and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost seems like this is outside because it, it represents our physical reality. And then maybe when we get into the temple, that's more of our spirit and we're getting deeper into our spirit. So it's almost like the altar when, when Jesus was sacrificed at this altar or crucified, I'm sorry. Um, you know, maybe that was a physical death of man, that physical nature of man dies, sac gets sacrificed. And because of that, because of like, for example, physical needs, you know, physical wants, like all of these things that we have physically, you know, all of that, if we kind of remove that, then we're able to dive deeper, say, for example, and go deeper into the tent, go deeper into ourselves, into our um, spirit and, you know, heal ourselves and become more powerful essentially. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. That's good. Okay, uh, the next question, uh, again, part of your homework assignment is what's the use and purpose of this fur uh, furniture? Uh, so the, the purpose and use was for daily sacrifices for forgiveness. So again, in those days, the fallen mindset was, oh my gosh, I just sinned. I... I did something stupid and now I need God in order to get right with God. I need to bring an animal sacrifice to this temple and have this animal sacrifice so that my sins can be forgiven. Now, does that sound very familiar with where we're at today with church and religion today is I need to confess my sins. I need to repent. I need to do all these things and make sure that, that I've done it correctly or else God will separate from me and he won't forgive me. So this was the fallen mindset of that day. And Psalms 51 says, for you will not delight in. So what's interesting about this is that this was designed, all of this sacrifice and the, even the temple <clears throat> was what God, God met man where he was. He knew that man had this fallen mindset that I needed to do something. So he created this system so that man could come back to him in love and realize who they really are. But from the beginning, Psalms 51 says, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart and he will not despise. So this was, God, God did not, he did not design this for his purpose, but he, it's for man. It's to help man. Um, 
I'm hoping that makes sense. He did not delight in this system here, but he allowed it because he met man where he was at. And he knew the only way that man would, would realize who they are was to go through the system. Because obviously after they got the sacrifice, then they were praising God. They were worshiping him and saying, yeah, God, I'm one with you. And thank you for forgiving my sins. And life is amazing. So they would have that union, but it took this physical act for them to see it in order for it to happen. So today we're not living that way. We already have that inside of us. So there's, you know, but we can go back and see what Jesus did and all of that. I, I'm hoping that makes sense, but God did not design it this way. This was not a requirement. It was for man's purpose. So in a way before what the way I'm, I don't know, I might be, I'm taking this kind of weird. Uh, so back in them days, it was, you had a object that you were sacrificing. Yep in order to get to Jesus, to get to God. Yep. Then the New Testament comes and Jesus shows that I'm sacrificing myself as the love for everybody that does not know or understand. Yep. I'm here to show you that it doesn't have to take other physical uh, objects to be able to, to find God. Yep. Just believe in me and I'll show you what God is, is trying to really show everybody in this world. However, Perfect. it's a choice. It's a choice to whoever wants to believe how, what a sacrifice is. So a sacrifice is, you know, you sacrifice for a friend, you're showing love, or you're sacrificing for your church, or you're sacrificing for another person. Um, it's not about pity or anything like that. It's about how you just show that the sacrifice, sacrifice to me is love. You're yeah. showing love through sacrificing something that you normally wouldn't do. Yeah, exactly. So, so what's interesting is today with religion, <clears throat> there's still a system set up in every church that you go to <clears throat> that says you need to confess your sins, you need to repent. It's as if you are coming back to this altar and sacrificing your animal and saying, God, I need to do this in order to be right with you. That system is in place still, even after thousands of years, it's still in place. Now, it might not be the physical, right? But it's the spiritual. So the sacrifice but, is the repentance. Right. So just like in the Old Testament, God is saying, hey, I didn't delight in this. I didn't choose this. I did it because I'm meeting you where you're at so that um, so that you know that you're right with me. But there was no sacrifice required. It wasn't needed. So just like today, we can choose to believe that there's nothing we need to do. It's already been provided. It's already in me. So the choice is there, right? There's two choices. Do I bring my sacrifice to God and repent and confess and, and quit smoking and quit drinking and promise God I'll never do that again? Or do we say, it's already done, just rest. So Hebrews 8, uh, 10 says, first Christ says, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them. So basically what, what, what Hebrews is quoting in Psalms 51 though they were required by the law of Moses. And notice it was the law of Moses, not the law of God. Then he, took, then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second one into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Christ once for all. So this old covenant system, he cancels that out. It's no longer required. There's no confession. There's no repentance. There's no alter, uh, animal sacrifice. The new covenant is it's done. It's finished. It's in me. I'm complete. I'm one with him. Once for all. God basically told Moses to go tell him to stop doing all that because it's not necessary anymore. No, no. Moses said, 
we got to do this. We got to set oh, this yeah. up. Okay, I got it. I got it. Yeah. So what 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 spiritual sim symbol does this piece of furniture represent? And I think we've already talked about this this uh, quite a bit. The bloodthirsty who would seek revenge on the innocent to relieve the suffering of the many. So God did not sacrifice his son and crucify his son. God did not kill Jesus. Man did. And that's because man, just like the lambs that were sacrificed, they needed something to relieve the, the, the fear and I need to do something. Um, but God allowed it, you know. God demonstrated, that's why it says Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love towards us by allowing this to happen. And John 11, 11 says, and one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not, uh, not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one, the children of God who were scattered abroad. So Caiaphas was the high priest and the high priest was the only one allowed into the Holy of Holies once a year. And he prophesied that one man would have to sacrifice for everyone. And that's exactly what happened. And being the high priest, he had the authority to make that statement and sure enough, it came true. So that's what that piece of furniture represented. And again, we've been talking about it, right? The sacrifice that Jesus had, uh, that's what that piece of furniture represents. Well, what's, what's really interesting is that, um, I mean, Jesus, the thing is, is it is a man thing because Caesar, uh, Pilate, the Roman government, they feared because everybody was calling Jesus king. And during that time, people were so obsessed with themselves and kings were so obsessed with themselves is, is that when you heard somebody like a Pharisee heard somebody say that was king, jealousy rises because money is at stake. You yep. know, a lot of their money is at stake. You know, the they were afraid that, you know, they were going to lose their riches to some king or some you know, in their eyes, some homeless guy or some probably in their eyes, but Jesus, you know, he, he did it not because he had to, he did it because he wanted to do it to show people. And that's, so God, you're right. God did not kill Jesus. Jesus did it out of love. He did it out of showing, he did it out of wanting so that people could, you know, understand. Yes, exactly. Pretty amazing. So how was this piece of furniture fulfilled in the New Testament? Um, again, we, we've, we've talked about it, right? It's, it's, it's the sacrifice. So again, this, this goes back to the questions in the homework assignment, right? What, what, was, what was the symbol and how was this fulfilled? We've been talking about it quite a bit. It's, it's pretty obvious, but some of the other pieces of furniture aren't so obvious. So you'll have to, uh, you'll have to be thinking about it, praying upon it, meditating on, on these questions uh, so that God can reveal these truths to you. You know, um, still, even with all of this, you know what, no matter how long I've been listening over the last year and been in these groups and all that, it still always brings me back to no matter what, it, it's Proverbs 3, 5, 6, you know, it's always, something always, I don't know, maybe it's just me, I don't know about anybody else, but it always just brings me back to that. It's all, everything in the Bible really just says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your own understanding, meaning of this world, on how the world is, yep. you know, and submit in all your ways to him and he will guide your path straight. So to me, I mean, everything from the Bible always relates to me back to that one verse, you know, it's no matter what, what should be done in this world is always just trust in him. And not on our own understanding. And I think that's the key to it is not our own understanding, but relating to what has happened in the past and what it has showed us and the way that it does convert into our world today is how we want to respond as, as, as a character of Jesus being on that cross, even though we're still walking on this earth, 
yep. and showing other people that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Lonnie, that, that verse is, is perfect. Um, and the way I view that is lean not on your own understanding. And what I view that as is physical. Your own yeah. understanding is all about the five physical senses, what your touch, taste, smell, and feel. And I know for you, you've got uh, you know, some medical issues. So for you, it's, it's not looking at that, but instead uh, lean not on your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And acknowledging is seen from the spiritual eyes. Yeah, I might have this physical thing, but spiritually, I know that I'm, whole, I'm holy, I'm blameless. In fact, here it is right here, uh, holy and blameless. Uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm choosing to lay self or ego, my persona on the altar. And rather than live by flesh, the five physical senses, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So love is his motivation. Love should be my motivation. He's always in me, living his life through me as me. Yeah, you know, and and, and with, with that being said, I, I can feel that at times because there's times my mind is like, man, Lonnie, just get up and start doing this. Yeah. yeah. You know, but then I, I'll start to get up and do that. And then all of a sudden there'll be that other second half of me now, you know, which is I know is God saying, Lonnie, sit your butt back down, man. <laughs> Knock it off, dude. You're not you're not ready for that. And I don't I'm not having you. Yeah. ready for that yet you know so there there's that understanding and it is self-ego mm -hmm. good Lonnie uh, I think I heard somebody else say something or yeah Who oh it was, it was Rashi I was just gonna say that um there's the number five again with the physical senses ah yes ah yeah by grace we have the senses <laughs> love it love it all right uh so let's uh let's move on to the conclusion so uh, the 30, 60, 100 fold, uh, each, each of these sessions that we go through every single week, we always talk about, you know, what makes it a 30, what makes it a 60, what makes it a hundred fold. So the 30 fold, the way they view this piece of furniture is in order to be forgiven, I need to confess all my sins. I'm not accepted unless I repent and confess. That's what 30 fold looks like. Um, that's the way they would view that piece of furniture. The 60 fold is God's spirit is in me and moves me to do amazing things, but I also need to create strongholds against that sin that so easily entangles me. So they're all about fighting and, and, and doing that. Um, um, and that, that, that spirit uh, allows them to do that. But a hundred fold says, I am the altar of sacrifice, which lives in me. It is a constant reminder of the love that God has for me and that I have for the world. If God was willing to do that for me, then I should be willing to do that for other people. But again, just as a reminder, you know, the first two are work-based, right? It's everything that we need to do in order to be. But the hundredfold is rest, and it comes from spirit, because I'm already there. I already have it all, and now I can just rest. You know, I, I, I just want to share something real quick. You know, I had a friend, uh, you, you know, I, ha I have a neighbor. You remember her, Doug. You met her. Yep. Yeah, across uh, the street. She, yeah, she actually, she moved out. She's uh, been out for a few days now. Uh, she moved to Elk Grove. However, long story short, she, uh, she's she been looking out for me. And so related to this, like, hundredfold, in a sense, uh, it's a reminder of the love uh, and the friendship uh, and uh, other people. She just came over the other day, uh, visited my neighbor downstairs, and she called me up and she's like, hey, Lonnie, have you been out of the house? And I was like, no, I haven't. I go, she goes, what you been doing, sleeping? And I go, yeah, that's what I do. Uh, and she's like, you have to get out of the house. She goes, we're going down to the pool. She goes, nice. come with us. So what I'm saying to it is that it, it, it's, you know, I, I've hardly known, I've known her for maybe just over a year. Yep. Um, from living here. Um, but she was somebody that had some concern, the care, and it showed to me that shows what the love of God is. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody had thought, you know, hey man, I just came back from El Grove after moving all my stuff. Yep. I'm gonna go swimming with the neighbor, you know. Hey, Lonnie, we need to get you out of the house, you know. Very so nice. 
that's what I look at as part of the as God for me and that uh, have a for this world. It's just people like that are that are mindful yep. of what others are going through, you know, uh, and, and just recognizing and being able to pull somebody out of their comfort zones. Too. Exactly. And I think if we go to the 10 truths, right? The 10 truth is I will be God to someone today. So she was God to you that day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I was going to there. So good. You beat me to it. All right. So um, I always ask this question to, you know, how good is God? Is he really that good where he provided all of this, you know, thousands of years ago as an example, uh, demonstrating, you know, what the kind of love that he has for us and the way you answer that determines your yield. You say, nah, you know, I still have to do my part. You know, God did his part. I need to do my part. You know, you're at a hundred, uh, you're at a 30 fold, uh, same with 60. And then a hundred fold is yes, he did. He is that good. And I can rest and I don't need to do anything. Um, just rest. So this again is just a reminder of this next week. Please continue to, uh, to work on the 10 truths. Uh, next week will be the bronze laver, which is the second piece of furniture. And uh, so please go on to the hundredfoldjourney.com on the website and pull that worksheet down. And the same questions that we'll be asking every single week for each of these pieces of furniture, uh, the ones that we did today will be asked about that piece of the furniture. So please be sure to pull that down. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, you can always reach out to me on Facebook or uh, you can text me. Uh, each of you guys have my number, so you know how to get, get through to me. All right, that's it for this morning. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. So uh, hang on just a second.